Okay. Are we broadcasting? Good. So I have a, uh, a colorful but very long uh, presentation that I'm going to give to you. Um, I would love for uh, you to uh, listen, and then we'll have time for questions and answering at the end. The uh, presentation will be made available in PDF format, as well as this webinar will be uh, recorded, God help me, um, and available for later for, for people to review. Uh, so let's just get going. We'll jump right in, and uh, we'll see uh, where we land. Okay, so let's proceed. Um, so here in the Thought Leadership Group, um, we're focused on trying to stimulate the marketplace to build better uh, solutions that meet the needs and wants of over people over 50. And what we'd like to demonstrate is the economic opportunity associated with meeting those needs and wants. And so our entry into that was a concept that we call the longevity economy. Uh, we took the concept of creating a macro economy focused on the serving the needs and wants of people over 50. And uh, we did an analysis around that and came up with a GDP uh, style uh, figure of $7.1 trillion of economic activity related to meeting the needs and wants of people over 50. Um, this breaks down across several different areas, but if you think of it as a GDP, for example, it brings us in at the third largest just behind the US and China and ahead of Japan, which you think is a fascinating economic opportunity. As people, more people age and their needs change, we think that this number is only going to grow and we'll be doing subsequent studies to give in a sense of how big uh, that, so that uh, pie will be going forward. But at this point, the 50 plus consumer is, resume, is responsible for over $7.1 trillion of economic activity. 3.0 trillion of it is in consumer spending. And what we'll drill into now is related to this $1.6 trillion that's in healthcare spending. For us to be able to further understand and be able to forecast and guide uh, both entrepreneurs and investors into the opportunities related to uh, serving the 50 plus and digital health, um, we came up with a concept called Health Innovation Frontiers in 2013. Um, this report that I'll be going through today is a refresh that we put out late last summer. Um, we're working on another refresh which will be hopefully be available um, in Q1 uh, or if, at worst, late Q2, early Q2 of 2016. But really what we did was we worked with a uh, research firm to come up with 32 different areas uh, that could be impacted by digital health technologies that roll up into what one could think is your best chance to have a healthy and active life. Uh, of those 32 areas, we then broke those down into nine areas of what we call health innovation frontiers. Uh, I'll be using those nine areas today to give you a sense of the economic opportunity, um, where we think best practices and solutions are, and some of the uh, best some of the other barriers to entry uh, that might prevent someone from being successful in these nine areas. But all in all, if you take all these nine areas and if you were able to deliver on all of them, uh, we think that a person has the best chance for living a healthy and active life um, well into the, the, the later years. Taken at, at aggregate, these nine areas uh, equal what we think is a $100 billion market opportunity. Um, $28 billion of that uh, is a revised figure from our first study, is related specifically to digital health innovations um, and new products and services that are uh, leveraging uh, new platforms that can serve the needs and wants of people as they age. Uh, the rest of the 68, as we have it here, um, relates more to traditional delivery mechanisms in the health and wellness uh, sector. But then, uh, as we expect things to move down, we're going to see cannibalization and have an increase of the innovation eating into that $68 billion. So I like to talk about the $100 billion pie related to this, while the $30 billion is really over the next five years where we think that there'll be uh, interesting uh, opportunities and innovations. Here we talk about the revenue breakdown amongst the nine areas, and you can see there's a, a huge difference around them. I think it's important here to call out that in some of these categories, solutions won't be made specifically only for the 50 or the 60 or the 75 plus, um, but are solutions that are that are relevant to other cohorts as well. Um, we've done our best to try to, to call that out um, and segment out what the 50 plus revenue opportunity is specifically, but if you take to, uh, a category such as physical fitness, you're going to find that Solutions that are relevant towards the 20s or 30 year olds may be relevant for the 50 year olds, but at the same time, some specialized uh, segmentations or different feature sets might be even more make them more relevant uh, for folks as they age. So I'm going to get into each of these uh, revenue breakdowns as we go into these nine areas. I apologize, I'm moving quickly. Uh, we're a little behind schedule, but also there's a lot of material to cover. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available as well as we'll have the opportunity for people to download this uh, this presentation and of course the, the report that we have is available both on the longevity network site as well as ARP's innovation at 50 plus website. 
So our first category we'd like to delve a little bit deeper, deeper into is medication management. And we consider this to be technologies that allow people to stay adherent to their me uh, medicine and prescription regimens and have a, a feedback loop between caregivers that might support those activities as well as the physicians that monitor and make changes in medications. Uh, we see this as a $1.4 billion opportunity. Uh, this is one of the areas that we revised down from our 2013 report because while we know there's an incredible need and incredible opportunity, uh, we're not seeing the market traction within the solutions that have been put out, which could be from a variety of uh, situations and, and reasons, which I'll get into in just another minute. But we know that over 90 million pe uh, people over 50 are taking multiple medications, and we expect this only to go up. And we know that it costs us billions upon billions of dollars each year uh, between people either not staying adherent or having uh, counter uh, interactions that are actually more detrimental than good. So uh, we're going to look at market segmentations here. It uh, looks like the slide format didn't quite come together as we would like to, so I'm going to hope that we can uh, get the original report out. But we break each of these areas into, uh, we have four different areas around compliance, um, uh, reminders, and other such areas. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of market activity going on right now. Uh, the, the disappointing thing is we don't have any clear winners in either one uh, of, of these categories, uh, nor do we see someone that's cobbling them together in a way that's being a comprehensive and uh, full full featured uh, product set that's making any traction or getting any gain uh, within the marketplace in spite of the fact that there's a tremendous need around this. If you take, for example, uh, something in, along the lines of intelligent pillboxes, which uh, are, are really great uh, in terms of the fact that they're able to help people um, remember when they have taken their medications, and certainly not to double dose, which can be incredibly difficult. Uh, but we're finding that there's a barrier to adoption around things such as bulkiness, um, the fact that they're not designed um, for, for the mass market and things such as, uh, such as the cost the, to, to make them um, available to people. So looking ahead, um, we're, we suggest that entrepreneurs and investors that are looking to get into this space or even large companies that are trying to refine existing technologies should look to the human factors associated with serving this market. So, for example, uh, gamification offers an interesting uh, and, and new way to get people to stay adherent. I know it's uh, been kind of overplayed in other areas such as geolocation and, and, and other um, uh, areas within uh, digital technologies, uh, but we think it's ripe here uh, in terms of getting people to stay adherent to their to their medications. Um, that considered too, we're looking for new business models that take on uh, the issues around the economics of dr drug affordability and then also trying to modify people's behavior so that they can stay more compliant because at the end of the day it seems that in this space it really is how does digital technology interact with people's uh, behavior and modify them so that they stay adherent. Our next category is aging with vitality, which is one of my favorite, um, because we use this as a, I wouldn't say a catch-all, but as a an area where we can keep uh, we can gather up all the sorts of different technologies that allow people to mitigate some of the declines that happen during aging, but also helps them live the best life, perhaps even better they, than they had when they were younger. Um, we're including in in this um, brain health, um, different sorts of. Uh, vision and hearing solutions that help people um, be able to keep up uh, with the way that they used to live and in some ways stay interactive with other folks that they may not because of uh, because of deficiencies. And we think this is a really interesting space for uh, entrepreneurs and investors to, to think about. We break this into four major areas really, um, cognitive brain health, uh, hearing and vision health, uh, preventive aging care, and everyday life support. Um, unfortunately, we have a, a, something of a logo soup that happens uh, on this deck uh, uh, when it's in a different format, and we list out different companies that are working in each of these different spaces. Uh, but, but suffice to say, there's a lot of activity around here, but we're not seeing our comprehensive or sort of uh, cross-functional solutions that are being offered into the marketplace. Now, what's interesting about this space, too, is I think this is where we're finding that people are spending the most money out of pocket, um, sometimes just to, again, to mitigate the declines. And sometimes, uh, sometimes it's just to, uh, to to be able to offset the um, and and get the most that they can where they're at. So a, a couple of reality checks. There, there's a lot going on here. It's happening very quickly, and in some cases, people are running full speed into a brick wall. So what we suggest for people is to take a, a moment, look at the market space, um, and then uh, really find out where are the needs and wants, and then try to design solutions that not only. Um, stand alone, but also can interact with other solutions so that they can be um, have the most market opportunity associated with serving these needs. 
So looking ahead, what we think is interesting is the, the confluence or the overlapping of different things such as apps, wearables, and other different more traditional products that come into kind of a, a, a micro internet of things around people's um, living their best lives and mitigating the, the declines associated with aging. Um, I think there's an incredible opportunity again for interoperability, um, pairing and partnering, and um, creating solutions that meet tailorable but different needs for different groups of people. Our next category is what we call vital signs monitoring. Um, in some ways, this is one of the older uh, categories related to um, supporting folks as they age with, di with digital health and, and electronics. Um, think of this as where you're gathering vital signs and biometrics and then transmitting them in some, some way to either the cloud or to other pr partner providers or caregivers in a way that this information can be shared across different platforms and utilized to make sure that people are healthy no matter where they are. So you can think of this as remote, remote monitoring. Um, you can think of it as in office, but also for the most part, we're looking and focusing on consumer-driven marketing uh, monitoring and um, people being taking uh, responsibility and being interested in their own health and safety. Again, we have a, a lot of different solutions that are in the marketplace. I'm um, realizing now I don't have this deck as memorized as I often thought I did, but um, we're going to see different things that fall into um, weight and, and, and heart month, weight and biometrics, um, activity trackers, um, and those sorts of things that all come together ideally to, to help give a better picture of how people um, can leverage technology to stay healthy and vital um, while not having to check into either a clinic, to a physician, or, or have other people um, checking in on them physically so they can live more independently. Thing is that most people don't know about these sorts of solutions and if they do sometimes they're intimidating and again there's also this feeling that this is big brother watching my watching me in terms of uh how, how i'm living and what i'm doing so i think there's a lot of opportunity here for for uh, different positioning of these technologies making them more cost effective and easier to use um, what we're excited about uh in in some senses is the number of large brands that have got into this space um, and that is great uh, for awareness of the space, but could uh, signal a, a challenge for smaller uh, startups that are trying to, especially in hardware plays, um, get involved and stay viable while the big players come in um, with all their uh, resources to be able to uh, shape the marketplace. So looking ahead, we're looking for uh, more uh, diversified uh, offerings uh, and the ability to bring in diff different parties so that the information that's collected from the individual themselves is being able to be distributed to the people that they need to have see it, but only in a way that is not intrusive or um, interruptive for those for those folks that need to see it. So we look forward to dashboards and alerts when um, patterns of norms have been disrupted or interrupted um, rather than data dumps that people then have to, to navigate and mitigate and be able to, to digest quickly. One of my favorite categories is our next one, which is care navigation. Um, to me, this is an interesting space because as the sandwich generation gets pinched in worrying about and managing the care of their loved ones that are older and their care of the loved ones that are younger, um, we see the opportunity for uh, new services and products that allow us to better schedule care, um, get people to and from care, um, be able to ensure that the, there's price transparency and bill reconciliation. Uh, and able to bring in caregivers to the home when necessary. Uh, we put all these things into this particular category. Uh, we think it's an interesting space, uh, especially as the needs of the older segments within our population increase, and we realize that we're strapped in terms of human resources uh, in the middle of the Gen Xers and the, in the sandwich and uh, early edge, I'm sorry, later edge uh, boomer population. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in this space. Again, we don't see any major players. Um, there is some activity lately. Um, yeah, companies like Honor have raised some, some interesting funds um, at rounds and drawn a lot of attention from the press um, in terms of delivering care to people's homes using uh, technology to be able to optimize that care and be able to dis, uh, disintermediate um, other sorts of uh, providers that have been in the middle. But uh, we haven't seen any market so solution that's being able to, again, to take traction across a large population here. Um, again, in this category, we have a, a huge variety of different source solutions, but I think it's the players that will be able to bring them together in comprehensive and integrated packages will, will be the most successful. 
So we're still looking and we're still trying to understand where the pennies will drop in this particular category. But I think it, uh, there's uh, no doubt in my mind that this is a, a vital for folks. And as information and awareness gets out into the populations about the offerings that are available, people start seeking these out and will be paying both out of pocket, but also, also leaning on the, the, the um, insurance plans of the people that are receiving the care uh, to be able to offset the costs associated with this. Our next uh, area is uh, related to emergency detection and response. Um, and this would probably be the most uh, traditional and long-standing category within the nine categories. Um, I think many people remember the uh, Help Me uh, I, I Fall and I Can't Get Up commercials from the 1980s. And we would put those sorts of emergency, uh, personal emergency response devices into the emergency detection and response category. Um, while that's the case, and these solutions have been around in some cases for a very long time, we don't see huge adoption within them, although there's an amount of revenue that is being uh, generated right now. What we're excited about is being able to leverage different platforms, whether it's mobile platforms or kind of shared and ambient and less uh, more passive and less um, active monitoring systems to be able to allow loved ones and in some cases uh, professional caregivers to know that an individual is healthy and safe in their environment and in some cases empower them to be able to leave that environment where in the past they may not have been able to do so safely. We're looking for different solutions um, that kind of cobble together and go across different segments to be able to allow people to live independently longer, but more importantly, to give them, both them the peace of mind and their loved ones a peace of mind that if should something go wrong, um, they'll be taken care of and made safe as quickly as possible. Again, we're balancing here a lot of the uh, negative stigmas around Big Brother watching me or um, people having to admit that they're giving up some of their independence, but we're seeing interesting entrants into the, into the market that are making it less in your face about the fact that you're using some of these monitoring and detection uh, solutions and more about empowering people to live the sorts of lives that they're excited to live. The next category is related to physical fitness. And again, as I mentioned on the onset, it's not necessarily uh, ser services and products that are being de developed only for people as they age, but in a lot of ways we're leveraging different technologies with a slight, slight twist or modification so that they're more relevant for people as they age. Um, what we find interesting about physical fitness, and we'll get into this into our next couple categories, is the interaction between different people and the motivation that happens when a family, a, a social unit, a community come together um, via digital technologies to encourage and in some cases challenge each other to be more physically active. Um, we think this is an in, incredibly uh, powerful and important category in that um, there's so much research that shows that as people become less active, um, the declines that happen in other areas of, of health and wellness um, are even more acute. So we're looking towards trying to keep people more engaged and more active while not trying to discourage them by making them feel that they're not actually doing as much as they should. So again, here behavior modification, gamification, community plays are going to be the sorts of things um, that we all know. Uh, just this week, um, ARP, along with some other partners, have published a report through our Project Catalyst initiative, The Power of We, around seven different uh, activity and sleep trackers that were in people's homes for six weeks. And some interesting findings from that relate to uh, the physical and design elements of the, of, of the actual devices, uh, technology failures in terms of being able to get the data off those devices and into usable platforms. Um, but the encouraging si signs were that the majority of people felt that these were relevant and interesting um, technologies, and then a subset of those felt that, that they would help them actually modify their behavior and keep them active longer. There's a lot of money around uh, physical fitness, and again, when done right, I think that a, a, a tracking device or a service that keeps people active when, as they age would also be relevant, for the most part, to folks that are younger. So the market opportunity is, is expanded above just the 50 plus. We're seeing things fall into three major categories, smart uh, watches, digital trainers, and software platforms. And I think it'll be a uh, infusion of the three of these that will be able to help people hit their maximum results. But I think as people develop different business plans in different companies, they need to take uh, need to focus on one of these and then look to be able to platform uh, to partner and to be able to integrate with other platforms um, to get the maximum gain, both uh, in terms of revenue, but also in terms of serving this population. 
hand in hand with with um, uh, physical fitness is diet and nutrition. We're very excited about the influx of new technologies that allow people to both uh, track what they've been eating, plan healthy meals, and in some cases procure the the ingredients to be able to build those meals. Um, but what we're not finding is that there aren't there. What we're finding is there are not very many services that are gearing and thinking to not only the specific diet and nutritional needs of people as they age, but also in interfaces and and platforms that are more accessible and easy for people um, as they age. But again, hand in hand with the physical fitness, we find that the the market solutions out there can have a huge impact on the overall draw on uh, the, the health system by preventing people from getting conditions that could indeed be preventable through uh, behavior modification, and in this case, um, better eating and more activity. So while our studies and, and information show that there's huge uh, need and acceptance around um, uh, people uh, from, from nutrition and wanting to eat better, we're finding that the current solutions aren't resonating with this particular population. And in some cases, um, even though they are getting the information, they're not adhering to it and following it. So what we have to figure out is how do we engage people, again, perhaps at a community level, at a family level, or perhaps a household level, so that, that they're interacting around food and using it in different and better ways, again, to stave off or perhaps um, be, prevent and, and stop fully conditions that might have a larger impact on people's lives, such as uh, type 2 diabetes and obesity. I think it's interesting that when we get people into stores, that we have people to empower them to make better decisions. But in some cases, I think it's almost interesting that we can keep them out of stores and have and only present them with better uh, decisions. Uh, so we're looking forward to those sorts of those sorts of information, and then the ability to be to tailor um, diets, menu plans, and and caloric intake to people's specific needs at a personal level. I think is a very interesting um, and, and huge area that is yet to be uh, fully explored. Tied to this and kind of underlying the, the last couple categories is, is something we call social engagement. And so this is the ability for people to stay engaged um, and to move outside of their home in, in several different le levels and areas. It could be uh, a community of like-minded or similar people. It could be their ability to get out and uh, pursue hobbies that they're interested in. It's their ability to keep connected and con in, in touch with their their immediate family and their extended family. Um, this again will tie very closely to our final category around behavioral health, but we find that the social engagement platform can include everything from uh, transportation, um, pet services, as well as um, just online platforms to keep people communicating with each other and connected in different ways that haven't been possible in the past. Uh, we're particularly concerned as people age um, in social isolation, um, as people lose peers, spouses, friends, uh, they can retract, and we want to find different solutions that allow people to be able to interact with folks on a more robust and engaged way. What we like about this is there's the ability for people to share information in both a personal and anonymous way about particular um, conditions that they might have in patient communities and be able to learn about different drug interactions, different cl clinical trials, the ability to reach out to people um, and, and provide support, whether it be um, when dealing with a, a similar situation that a spouse might have gone through or a personal situation to them. Um, digital inclusion solutions, again, are these things that allow people to be, stay engaged and in touch with their community and family caregiving network in a way so that they don't feel isolated. Um, depression and isolation is both a symptom and a cause of a lot of different chronic conditions. Uh, and to anything we can do to offset that, I think, it benefits the system and society as a whole. And then the ability to call in assistance when one needs it, whether it's a, a raw, quick ride or whether it's a, um, a delivery service or whether it's the ability to uh, get to a social event. We think it's very key to allowing people to stay independent and live more healthfully. Again, in the sake of time, I'm moving a little bit quickly. Um, we'll have a better version of these slides up that have more of the market opportunities um, will be available through the website and associated with the webinar going forward. So moving last to our final area, we're looking at behavioral and emotional health. Um, this has been an underexplored area in our opinion, um, and we've, we've not found a lot of uh, solutions coming up until the last maybe uh, 18 to 24 months, which is a very exciting and encouraging situation. But what we're talking about here is the opportunity to give people, um, give them the opportunity to work with professionals, whether it be uh, machines or um, uh, live uh, human professionals, to help them navigate through not only this, the situations that happen um, as one o is older, whether it be divorce, um, children leaving the house, or the death of a spouse or loved one, but also to be able to 
um, reach out to each other and keep each other engaged in, 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 in a better mental state. We see this as a $1.7 billion opportunity, um, although I think that as we're seeing activity and investment, and when we do our next uh, round of this, uh, this report, we're going to see that number go up as traction happens, adoption happens. Um, in some ways, this particular space is, is, is very good for this particular demographic in that um, when you get to the greatest generation, people that are either homebound or come from a different uh, mindset that uh, in, in office talk therapy sessions aren't as... Uh, aren't as, as socially acceptable and sometimes carry a stigma with them. So the ability to do teleconsults, teletherapy, text therapy might be very uh, powerful in keeping this, this population more healthy. Um, so we're very excited about this particular um, solution, although we're not seeing tremendous amount of differentiation between the different solutions that are being offered. So I think in some ways, even though this is a nascent market, it's yeah, there's a tremendous opportunity uh, for um, breakthrough or different innovation that could really change the way that folks um, are interacting uh, with this and maintaining their mental and um, physical health. So for example, um, the op opportunity for uh, robots or digital companions to avatars to help people feel engaged and involved, but also be able to gather information that might be going back to the caregiving or family segments to be able to have them interested in knowing how their parents are doing. So I'm gonna burn through some what we call key findings that are coming out of this particular report um, that covers our nine areas. And then I'll try to take some question and answer. So I'll probably be quick uh, about these in the, in the um, sake for the sake of time. So one of the things we're in, in particularly intrigued about is um, is telling companies to get ready for the, the coming turnaround, which for us is the consumer awareness and empowerment that's happening from outside um, the 50 plus digital health economy through all sorts of different stratas within digital health and really in people becoming empowered and, and responsible for their own well-being. Um, we think there's an interesting opportunity to leverage the trust gap. And it's a little bit counterintuitive, but because there is no clear leading organizations or companies or brands that are associated with digital health and aging, there's the opportunity for outsiders to come in. And we'll cover this a little bit in the next couple, couple slides as well. Um, again, too, we think it's important to focus on the caregiver. Um, for our purposes, we typically refer to uh, caregivers as uh, either a spouse, um, family member, uh, typically either the adult child daughter or, or daughter-in-law. Um, who's been tasked with managing uh, not only their own sets of caregiving activities for their family, but also for the, uh, the, the extended family in terms of the parents. Um, solutions that empower these people, that give um, them respite, but also allows them to be more efficient, are going to be critical as we uh, navigate sort of the demographic shifts within the U.S. society. You can bridge the divide in some ways, again, referring back to, to sort of the outsider play, um, to be able to bring together different players in this space that have typically worked in silos. So whether it's um, pharma, payers, and providers, how do you create solutions that pull together different data sets but also different services to come up with comprehensive solutions that allow people to age more, more well and more healthfully? Again, we're seeing different entrants into this space, so it's time for existing players to figure out is it time to um, partner or is it time to defend their spaces where they're going? And in some ways, we're seeing really interesting adjacencies from, from existing companies um, and their ability to come in unencumbered uh, and with fresh eyes to be able to create some very disruptive and interesting solutions. Again, sort of tying these other concepts together is how do you get together and cr cr create horizontal cross-platform and cross-siloed different solutions? And so what we need to see is not different, uh, not things that stand alone, but things that come together in, in, in full platform so that people can live um, and get the most out of fighting their conditions and maintaining their health and wellness. We're excited about some of the consolidation that's happening in the marketplace. Um, it shows that there's traction, that there's um, there's interest here. We're seeing some big numbers in terms of investments and acquisitions. So it's, it's a good thing to see that larger players are in some cases um, working with or in some cases acquiring smaller and more innovative solutions. I think it, it points to the legitimacy of, of these sets of solutions. What we're still not seeing though is that the solutions themselves are affordable for people that need them. And so uh, we did a report many years ago um, called Healthy at Home, uh, where we asked uh, we asked different consumers of the digital health technologies that might, might allow them to, to age independently, um, what would be the price point they could spend per month on, on many of these technologies? And the answer was around $50. 
what we found the market reacting to is we saw a bunch of different solutions, point solutions, all targeted at $50. And to have a comprehensive uh, home-based solution would be in the neighborhood of $450 to $500, which was well beyond the means of the folks that they were trying to serve. So we still need to see innovations become affordable, which we think will happen as technologies, of course, uh, the cost of technologies come down and there's more infrastructure that could be leveraged at a lower price point. All this data that will be generated through these different products and services needs to be actionable so that we can find different ways to use them and, and improve the quality of life for people. At the same time, too, we can do great good with that, but also maybe monetize this and then give people predictive analytics to know where their next turn might come in terms of care, health, and activities. We need to make these innovations more usable. This is a simple design play. Um, interoperability, as we found in the, uh, at the activity trackers, uh, study and um, setup are still major difficulties. There are around 40% of people that partook in that particular activity and sleep tracker study weren't able to find the instructions within the packaging. Uh, then so therefore we're left to their own to try to figure out how do I actually even set up this, this device. Even with those devices though we need to move beyond sensors. Um, there, while people are, are interested in wearing some things, uh, the form factors are not comfortable and they're not always usually using them. So we need to come up with different solutions that are more, people are used to and can more comfortable with so that we can um, truly behave, affect change on their behaviors and get them to be more interested in taking control of their own health. Uh, that leads into what we would, we would consider that it is more about behavior and not biometrics. Um, to a certain extent, having a dashboard of your personal activity or your biometrics is, in, is intriguing, but without any sort of guidance or motivation to change your behavior, we're finding it falling flat specifically with this, this demographic. So we're looking for different usability solutions and different um, uh, value propositions, um, both in terms of behavioral economics as well as perhaps pure economics to get people to stay adherent and to stay active and to take, consider their health in a different way than they have in the past. Finally, it's one of our charges that this is this. There's a huge opportunity in direct to consumer here. Um, while other solutions will be more viable if they're prescribed or they take place within institutional settings, this is a unique time uh, in digital health as well as health in general for where people are taking control and deeping, digging deep into their own pockets to be able to buy solutions that they think and and daily will help them live better lives. And so we encourage companies to not always only focus on direct to consumer but use direct to consumer perhaps as uh, an on-ramping accelerating way to improve their design and then perhaps build a more institutional or provider payer uh, focused uh, solution and finally we want to change the conversation around uh, health and wellness technologies we're not talking about aging in place we're talking about independent living um, people don't want to feel like there's a potted plant stuck in one place and technologies are being created to keep them there. They want to feel empowered. They want to feel that they can go out, they can do what they want to do and live the life that they've been living or the life that they're still aspiring to live. And we feel that digital health and wellness technologies have a huge role to play in being able to empower people to do that, keep them healthy and keep them happy. That's, that's the nine health and innovation frontiers. Uh, again, I apologize that the slides, um, we had to switch to PDF the last minute because we we're having technical difficulties. They didn't contain all the data that the, the PPT had. Um, we're going to work on being able to make that available to people. The, down, the report that contains all this information, again, is downloadable um, both on the longevitynetwork.org as well as um, innovation at 50, ARP.org slash innovation 50 plus. Um, I'm going to take some time now to answer a couple questions. Um, that, that have come over while we've been moving ahead. Uh, I'm going to stop the screen share if I can and try to answer some of these questions that have been delivered to me uh, via text. Okay, so the first question is, um, how do you think models such as gamification and sharing economy, uh, for example, a Uber, change for an order audience if they change at all? Um, so I, I'm, I'm particularly intrigued about this, the shared economy especially, um, both from uh, a resource and a consumer perspective, I think, are fascinating when you bring in this demographic. So, for example, um, ARP has is explored um, about the untapped opportunities of older workers that might have spare time and become um, Uber drivers. I think that's a, a unique shared resource that's being underutilized. Um, but I think at the same time, as um, we're able to educate folks that um, the shared economy is a business model, which some of us have trouble getting our mind around, but once we do uh, see the incredible power and impact associated with it, um, I think we're going to see uh, huge adoption around that 
especially as adult children are able and services build in the opportunities for adult ch children to be able to order up a car or a meal or a delivery or an interaction, social interaction, on behalf of the elder who may not be the one actually holding the smartphone and making the decision or making the call. Gamification, I think, is yet to be explored. Um, it was huge a few years ago, I would say, in mass uh, mass market. It's still, um, I think, we've, we've dialed back gamification outside of the games themselves, but I think there is the opportunity, perhaps, to tap into this market and keep people engaged using sort of behavioral economics and gamification theories and techniques that have been successful in other areas of general technology. Another question is, um, what do I think the single biggest change in uh, 50 plus health tech market will be in the next five years? Um, I think here too will be, there'll be an incredible, as uh, the barriers to entry and the platforms become more stable and usable, I think there's going to be a huge explosion in, a, in adoption. And I think that um, for the first time, ARP has been able to demonstrate that over 50% of people over 50 are holding smartphones and using them regularly. Um, that's a statistic that just came out about a month and a half ago. So as we see that arc of smartphone comfortability, utilization, and adoption uh, ramp up, as well as uh, form factors get larger, such as um, the, the iPhone 6 and some of the larger galaxies, uh, I think we're going to see greater adoption of technologies that become a uh, enabling platform to then deliver different digital health services. I think that the area of uh, um, anti-isolation and inclusion will be particularly interesting as people become more comfortable with chatting with people online, doing Google Hangouts such as this, and being able to interact with people. Uh, one of our fears about that area though is that we don't want to set up different pods where people end up remaining isolated in their homes but connected only through uh, technologies. So it's very important for people to have human interaction. And I think uh, with perhaps some of the shared economy uh, elements that I, were mentioned before, it might be possible to tap into a uh, semi-professional network of people that could then create these social interactions in a healthy and safe way. Okay, and here's a, the, another question is, how can we design solutions for a population with variable tech literacy? Uh, that's, that's key and I think that's very interesting. Um, of course, we are big fans of design principles uh, in, in alignment with the concept of design for all, where one takes into account all the different needs of different subsets, and in some cases designs towards the lowest common denominator uh, under the impression and the, the expectation that if something works for uh, people with the most difficulty, it'll be most accessible for people um, that have the highest abilities. Uh, I think going forward, one needs to keep into mind that people don't just want bigger buttons and bigger fonts, but they want elegant solutions that meet their needs in a way that they can utilize. Um, it's not just nearly a matter of, of making things simple. We don't want to dumb things down, but we want to optimize on what things are. Uh, in some ways, I feel that um, technology is focused too much on customization and the ability for people to create their own customization, and sometimes that can be overwhelming. So if we can come up with solid, usable designs both form factor and interface, uh, we'll be able to include as many people as possible. And I think we're still going to find the trend of younger people and adult children having to educate and include uh, the older folks and in some ways drag them either willingly or kicking and screaming into utilizing some of these technologies. Question, do you think that Philly is a good place for a health start tech startup? Is it better than Boston? Hmm. We're seeing pockets of, of activity for health tech all across the country. In fact, I wish I had a hundred dollars for every company that, or for every city that's told, that's mentioned that it wants to be the um, uh, the 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 capital of health technology for X, Y, and Z. Um, I think there are pluses and minuses to being in established markets. I think the pluses are perhaps um, uh, a network, a better network of investors that might have money to back some of these. In some cases. Uh, there are different institutions that have the ability to either increase or on-ramp um, and, and explore expertise with different companies and organizations. Uh, in my opinion, um, a person can start a very good company anywhere and should be able to be able and should yet be nimble enough to be able to visit different markets. Um, some of the elements I think that are critical for a health tech company to be successful in terms of a market would be uh, some sort of infrastructure around uh, investments and mentorship. Uh, there should typically what we see to make things successful is having a, um, a university healthcare system, a learning hospital nearby, um, whether it be because that creates entrepreneurs or um, creates and trains entrepreneurs that are looking into this space or also gives the opportunities for um, low level pilots and connections. And then finally, um, there needs to be some sort of uh, uh, 
uh, gestalt around health and wellness technology in a particular uh, geographic or metro area so that there's the interaction between different entrepreneurs and the resources and the ability to come together. So uh, I couldn't, I don't think I would rank Philly above Boston. Um, it could be the next big place. And this will be our last one for the sake of time. Um, how can how can one balance needs, for example, taking more meds with desires? For example, uh, I want to go on more vacations, of vacations, for example, of the senior market. Um, you know, I wouldn't, in some ways to me, this is more of a, um, can one support the other in sort of a, a positive dynamic uh, equation? So uh, to me, they're not diametrically opposed, but hopefully reinforce self-reinforcing. So if someone's, if there's the ability to empower people to take the medications as they want and minimize um, both the, the negative outcomes of that, both in terms of side effects and economic side of, uh, outcomes, it, it presents the opportunity for uh, the people that do what they want to live the better life, to have the more vacations. I think at the same time, having the ability to go on more vacations might be a powerful motivator to keep people in alignment with what they're trying to do or need to do in terms of their health and wellness needs. So to me, these are two parts of a larger equation, perhaps two parts of a balanced equation. Um, but I'm not sure that, it, that one needs to worry about balancing uh, specifically between the two. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone that tuned in. I again apologize for some of the technical difficulties, but this is our first go around. Um, I encourage all of you to take time to stop by longevitynetwork.org, um, which has really turned into, in my opinion, an incredible resource for anyone focused on health and wellness needs of people over 50 plus. Uh, we will be publishing more research and ideally engaging with the community again, uh, whether it be th through this format or out on the road at conferences. Uh, but I appreciate everyone taking the time and uh, have a good afternoon. Thanks.